The Open Door Baptist Podcast features the insightful preaching and teaching of our senior pastor, Jason Murphy. It also comprises of special messages from a number of guest speakers throughout the year. The purpose of this podcast is to be a witness in our community, to encourage others to grow in their relationship with God through the preaching and teaching of His Word, and to serve others in the name of Jesus Christ. Your Bible this morning, if you would, Proverbs chapter 23 and 1 Corinthians 19. Proverbs 23 and 1 Corinthians chapter 19. If you don't have a Bible with you today, I encourage you to reach forward in the pew in front of you and uh, use that as we look into the scriptures here this morning. Proverbs 23 and 1 Corinthians 19. As you're turning there, I want to mention just a couple things uh, by way of introduction. Uh, I know we've been in the book of Esther, and I know that um, we have an il- we have a, a uh, illustration over here. Uh, this is not a gallows for like Haman. It's not a noose. Uh, I'll reference it here. But the dean's worried because he's my volunteer this morning. Um, but uh, I'll mention it here in just a little bit. Also, want to mention um, many of you know that I guess it was about six half six and a half years ago or so that um, I was diagnosed with celiac disease, a celiac sprue, and um, um, so that was, yeah, six and a half years ago, and what had happened was I just got really sick, I got really sick, I got really sick, I was not gaining any weight, I was getting no nutrients to my body. I don't know the, all the chemistry of it, I don't know all the details of it, I just know what they told me, and, um, <clears throat> and I just got really, really sick, and... Um, so they ended up doing an endoscopy and like I guess they took a little biopsy of my small intestine and all the villi was all laid flat. I guess they, the way they explained it to me is no nutrients were getting to your body. And that's why a lot of ladies that get this will get osteoporosis. I'm just telling you what they told me. I don't know how factual it is. I'm just repeating what they said. And, um, and so I, I had that about six and a half years ago. And they basically said, you're allergic to wheat and flour and gluten, barley, you know, and on and on and on. The list goes long. And um, I said, well, what can cause this? And they said, well, you know, you can get really, really, really sick. You can lie dormant, but you can get really, really, really sick. Uh, or if you're under a lot of stress and went back to six and a half years ago is when I took over for Pastor Blue, and that was when I was diagnosed, and I was thinking, let's see here, uh, I'm not a math whiz, but I figured that out, and uh, so I say all that to say this, um, Friday at work in my office, I was just kind of working all day, and I didn't bring a lunch, and didn't have a lunch with me, and uh, I just, I don't normally do that, and, and I was just starving, and uh, I texted my wife and said, you know, can you make some of that gluten-free pizza? It's really good. And she said, yes, I'll do that for you. And I texted her around 5.30 or so and said, I'm on my way home. I'm starving. And so uh, she makes the pizza. She makes it for Micah, makes it for me, et cetera, et cetera. And so I just said, you know, I want sausage, mushrooms, black olives, onions, extra cheese, a little olive oil, whatever. And, uh, and it's really good. And so I sat down that Friday night and I ate three pieces and I could not believe how good it was. Literally, I remember looking at her and said, you could open up a store and sell this. And it was, you know, A, I hadn't eaten lunch and B, it was really, really good. And so I figured since I hadn't eaten lunch, I went back and got two more pieces. So I ate five pieces of that pizza and it was about 30 minutes later, I kept saying, man, I ate that too fast. Something is not right. And lo and behold, they realized that what I did was I ate, my wife made it on Micah's crust, the normal one, and I ate five five pieces of normal, full gluten, flour, wheat, whatever's in it. And um, I got really sick, really sick. And... I started, uh, let's just put it this way. I lost five pounds and I lost it really quick. (laughs) And if I ever wondered, you know, because I never messed around with, hey, I think today I'll just, you know, I'll eat uh, a regular piece of pizza. No option. I just never did it. I never, ever messed around with it because I understood from the GI tract to the blah, 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 blah. So I just didn't do it. And so it was the first time my body had ever had that in its 
system for six and a half years. I didn't stay long, but it was there. And I got really sick. And I'm just recovering. Uh, even now, I'm very weak. I, um, I woke up uh, that next day and I, was so, I had the worst headache because I was so dehydrated because I lost, I couldn't even hold water down. So I, just, I was super dehydrated and I've tried to rehydrate myself. And I told Pastor Kennedy, I said, be ready. He said, I'm praying. <laughs> and so um, needless to say, um, this is a pre, I didn't get my normal coffee. So this is a pre-coffee message. So I cannot be held accountable for anything I say today. Hey, this is pre-coffee, and uh, that's just a reality. And I'll tell you, the moral of the story, I say all that to say this, the moral of the story is you don't mess with Mary. <laughs> that's the moral. So I forgot a Valentine's gift, you know? She poisoned me. <laughs> I did not forget a Valentine's gift. And she said she felt really, really, really bad. But she kept laughing. I said, this is not funny. There's nothing funny about this. And then Micah started laughing, and it was just a mess. It was a disaster. And uh, so I am here today, and uh, so I'm glad you're here, and uh, trust that this message will be a blessing to you today as we consider this thought of surrender for such a time as this. Look at Proverbs chapter 23 and verse number 26. And Brother Chad, you can put that up there, that slide, if you would. 23, 26. One verse, one verse. Notice here, if you would, the Bible says, My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. Read that verse with me, if you would. My son... Give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. Let's look over at 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and notice if you would, verse number 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse number 18, and then verse number 19 as well. We're going to look at those couple of verses and then we'll have a word of prayer together. All right? 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. The Bible says, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which, you, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are whose? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time that we have together this morning. I pray that you'll help us to have a greater understanding of how if, we, if we're saved, that we, we don't belong to ourselves. We belong to you. You've purchased us. And we are to glorify you in our bodies. And I pray today if there may be somebody in here that has never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, as their savior, that today they'll put their faith in the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ as their only hope for heaven. And we'll be careful to give you the glory for that as well in Jesus' name and amen. Now, one of the, one of the reasons I chose the theme for such a time as this is simply because I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back soon. I believe that. I, I don't just say that as a cliche to say I believe it. I think from a numerical standpoint, I think from uh, the Is Israel standpoint and the surrounding Arab nations of how things are shaping up in the Middle East, I think of uh, what's going on, the, the condition of the church, as the Bible calls it in the New Testament, the falling away of the church in uh, First Corinthians, or First Timothy chapter 4 and chapter 3. All those variables together, I believe wholeheartedly that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. So therefore, I chose the theme for such a time as this. In, in essence... What that means is that, that really that time is of the essence. We're to do what we are to do for such a time as this. Because we don't have much 
time. When, I think, when we think of the word surrender in the context of Christianity, I think many people be, begin to become fearful. When we talk about total surrender, a good analogy of that is Ezekiel 47, where you have, uh, you know, uh, the, the spirit brought him through and the, to the ankles and then to the knees and to the waist. And finally, he was all the way in the river and was in control of the water, which was a type of the spirit. And it's total surrender. And I don't have any qualms about saying today this statement, God's will for you and for me is that we fully surrender to him. Yes, that we surrender to him, that he has our lives. And not that we just put it all on the altar and that we take it back, but that we give him our lives and that we yield our members as instruments of righteousness for his glory. So people many times, when they hear of the word surrender in the context of Christianity become fearful, it carries with it uh, kind of the fear of the unknown. I'm going to read you just a brief article. CNN did something recently about, uh, it's called Mars One. How many of you have heard of Mars One, folks going to Mars and this and that? How many of you have heard that or read that or know a little bit about it? Okay. Just a, a, an example, if you will, of somebody who's willing to surrender their life, their life, because when you hear the article, you'll understand it for something so trivial which I would say trivial, especially in the context of um, what they're talking about. I'm going to try to clip this on while I read it. Mars One, a group that plans to send humans on a one-way trip to Mars, has announced its final 100 candidates. They've selected the 100 candidates out of 200,000 applicants that wanted to take a one-way trip to Mars. And they'll do some further testing later this year, and they expect to include team building and later isolation that they'll work on. Eventually, 24 out of those 100 will be selected to make up six crews of four, which Mars One says they hope to launch to the red planet uh, every two years, starting in the year 2024, which is nine years roughly from today. With the aim, with the aim, the goal of starting a colony on Mars. Now, the Dutch nonprofit hopes to use existing technology to carry out the mission. However, the planet has been difficult uh, for those who've, who've, you know, explored it. And uh, with only one half of unmanned missions succeeding to Mars. The journey itself is expected to take around seven months, and a recent study by MIT found that should the explorers succeed in landing, using current technology, the people, the 24 that are, gonna, w that are willing to surrender to this, uh, will only live, MIT in their study with the conditions, what have you, the, the people will only live 68 days once they're there. That's why it's a one-way trip to Mars. So what kind of person chooses to go to Mars on a one-way mission? Well, the list of 100 finalists includes scientists and uh, those high in academia, and those are just seeking the ultimate adventure. Now you say, well, preacher, what does that have to do with 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19? I'll tell you what it has to do with. It has to do with it in this context. There are people willing to surrender their entire life to go to Mars to live for 68 days. Now, think about that for just a minute. God has saved you. God has saved me. And he wants us to give him our lives for the glory of God. And yet many times we have a tendency to hold things back or to be reluctant to trust him with their lives. One of the mysteries always been to me is that people that ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into their heart to be their personal savior and say, Lord, take me to heaven when I die. If I drop dead, I know the Bible says to be absent for the body is to be present with the Lord. I know I'm going to be with you. I believe that you're going to do that. If not, it's going to come in the voice of the uh, archangel and the trump of God and the dead of the Christ will rise first and we're going to go to glory. Amen. And we believe it. We say, praise God. And we, we believe that. But then when it comes to surrendering, that's, that's putting our all on the altar. We have a tendency to be reluctant, and that's a fear uh, of trust. Now, I'll give you an example here of trust. Uh, Brother Dean, if you want to come on up here, Dean is going to be my example for this. It may be a base analogy, but I, I'm going to use myself in, the, in this picture here as a type of the father. 
And I'm going to say to Dean, who in, my, in this story here would be my son. And I said, Brother Dean, and go stand right next to that handrail over, if you would, about 12, 15 feet from that 45-pound uh, brick hanging from the ceiling. I want you to trust me. <laughs> and I'm going to take this, and I'm going to swing it. Well, I'm going to bring it all the way up to your nose. And then I'm going to let, now some of you know the laws of physics and, and it's going to be easy for you. Um, but I'm going to explain something to you. This is going to take on his part, because I'm going to tell him, don't, this is the prerequisite, don't flinch. There's no flinching. That means you didn't trust me. You're just to stand there and wait. Now we've only had one casualty. Uh, it's not a huge deal. Um, it says don't touch. Right, exactly. And then my goal is for it not to touch you, all right? But I want you to trust me, okay? I'm going to bring this all the way up. Matter of fact, back up just a hair, just above your head. Just, yeah. What's the nail? Oh, that's in case. <laughs> and I want you just to stand still, and I'm just going to let it go, and we're just going to see what happens. Close my eyes. No, you can't close your eyes. Close my eyes. Oh. That's, no, that's not trust. Ooh, that just moved. Why did that move? Okay. Oh, I see. Uh-oh. This might go south. No. We've trusted it every which way. Um, but you can visit Mason at Stevens Hospital on floor number four. So I'm going to let this go. Now, you're not to move one bit. You're going to totally trust me, correct? You're going to stand here with me? Yeah, no. Okay, so just stand still. You've got to open your eyes and just trust me. Okay, and you can't move. And hey, let's hear it for Dean. Don't, don't run into it. Did he stand still? Good job, Dean. You may be seated. Thank you. Now, I did that with some others and they jumped back. He trusts me. Well, he's known me 20 plus years and he also probably knows the laws of physics and the, and the uh, law of the pendulum. But having said that, now that be, might be a base analogy, but you know what God says to you and God says to me? He wants you to surrender. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to be able to give your life, just as, I, just as Abraham did with Isaac, on the altar, on the altar. Place it and say, I'm yours. Do whatever you want with me. Do you understand there's some tranquility in that? There's some peace in that? There's some comfort in that? There's some solace in that? When you actually do it. And we don't hold anything back. So my desire this morning is very simple. I want all, all of us to be reminded. Very simple. We don't belong to ourselves. We were bought with a price. Our bodies are the temple of the living God. And God desires that we take our bodies and he's not going to force himself on you and surrender and yield them to him. Now, when we think about surrender, it can be perceived on a large scale how our minds work. For an example, well, this person surrendered and they're going to leave their family and they're going to go to the mission field and all the amenities and everything and they're going to die on the field over here and they're going to be missionaries. Or this person surrendered to be a pastor or this person surrendered to, you know, Maybe you're here today, you've never won a soul to Jesus Christ. You've never been able to lead somebody in prayer and lead somebody to Christ. You say, you know what, preacher? I know March 1st, we're going to start our Real Hope teams. I want to be a part of one of those teams. I might not be the leader, but I'm going to be willing to be trained. I'm going to surrender so I can be a witness for Jesus Christ. That's part of surrendering. Secondly, it might even be so, I wouldn't call this base, but just the elementary beginning points of I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to read the word of God daily to feed my soul. Man shall not live by bread alone, by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Prayer, maybe just starting a prayer list, things of that nature. But part of that altogether is surrendering and doing what God wants you to do. But whatever the case may be, I can say unequivocally that God's desire for you and for me is for us to surrender for such a time as this. Now go back to 1 Corinthians 16 and notice the word temple. The word temple refers not to the whole place of the temple, but just to the holiest of holies, the place where God dwelt in the temple. Paul's trying to tell us here that we are the dwelling place of God Almighty. It appears that many were using their bodies for immoral purposes and were defiling the temple. 
In Corinth, there was the temple of Diana. Diana was the, was the goddess of sex and love. And before, sitting outside of the temple, there was you know, over a thousand female priestesses and, uh, and all kinds of ungodly and perverse things taking place there. And um, it's just a sad situation. And, and really, that'd be a modern day term for prostitutes. Uh, you can read about it. Uh, as I taught through the book of Ephes uh, Ephesians, you learned more about it on Thursday nights. Now, listen to this. When God gave his plans for the tabernacle, don't miss this. And later on, God gave plans for the temple. And he gave them in, in, in real detail. He made it crystal clear. And that's why you just read the fine tune. You're like, why is Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers? And it's just all this stuff. You know, read Genesis. You got the whole world, everything being created in seven days. And in just a few chapters, right? Or six days and then the seventh day he rested. Then you get into the temple and you've got entire books dedicated to that. And in that temple, he set forth in no uncertain terms that the plain fact that he demanded purity in the materials, in the construction. Otherwise, he would not fill that temple with his glory. Listen, folks, God will not fill a dirty temple. There are several comparisons between our bodies and the original temple that God built in the Old Testament. First of all, it was a pure place. The earthly temple was a place wholly dedicated to the glory of God. Nothing that defiled would be allowed. Remember when the priest would go into the Holy of Holies? He was supposed to take off even his what? His shoes. Take his shoes off. Nothing. When something out of the ordinary occurred, God took care of the problem right away. Uh, let, let me give you just a quick example. Hold your place. Look at Leviticus chapter 10. Just real quick, if you would. Leviticus 10. I want to give an example of what God, how serious God is about the temple. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Third book in your Old Testament. Leviticus. Look at chapter 10. And look at verse 1. You notice here in, Je in Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 1, and Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took off them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had commanded them what? And they went out from the Lord and devoured them. Uh, when they went out from the Lord, the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. The sons of Eleazar offered strange fire before the Lord, and God killed them. Now it appears from the text, look, keep going down, look at verse number 8. These men were guilty of drunkenness before the Lord. Look at verse 8. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye what? No, this is an Old Testament principle, and it's, it's clear, and it says it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that you may put difference between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean. You say, preacher, what's your point? God wants our vessels, our temples, to be clean. And God wants us to take our temples, our bodies, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, our bodies and present them before the Lord in surrender, saying, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Acts chapter 9, Saul gets saved. God changes his name to Paul. He says, first thing in road to Damascus, what will thou have me to do? You have Ezekiel crying for a man to stand in the gap. You have Isaiah saying, here, uh, when, when, the, when, the, when the verse goes, uh, when it says, uh, who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here am I, send what? And many times, unfortunately, we say this all the times, we hear uh, Christians saying, here am I, send somebody else. <laughs> in all reality, we, we ought to be willing. We're safer in the will of God than doing our own thing. Amen. And you have to remember that. So just like the, er uh, the earthly temple uh, our bodies are set apart for his glory. We've been bought with a price. 
In essence, we don't belong to ourselves. And again, just as a reminder, we sang a little bit about this morning, but what was that price? You look at Acts, you think of Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto the church of God. Okay? And he goes on to say, speaking of that, which he has purchased with his own blood. What was the price? The price that purchased you and me, if you're saved, was the blood of Jesus Christ. Paid for your sins. And the Bible says when you get saved, that blood, just a good example is Exodus 12, it is applied to you and your sins are forgiven. Now I want you to take your Bible real quick and go to Genesis 22. Genesis 22, as we think about surrender, I want you to make a note of this. Surrender. Very familiar passage when it comes to surrendering. Surrendering requires listening to God. You may be here today physically, but that doesn't mean that you're listening to what God may have for you. Listening to God. Genesis chapter 22, would you notice verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, he said, Here am I. Here I am. And he said, take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Notice what Abraham says in 22 verse 1, behold, here I am. This means Abraham was already in fellowship with God. As though God, as we go through life, God's going to put demands on our lives or requirements or requests or things that he wants. They're going to call for sacrifice. They're going to call for us to step out in faith and surrender just in certain areas. And you say, preacher, what's the area? I don't know, but God knows in your life and God knows in my life what that area might be that he may want us to surrender in. From a human perspective, we may not want to participate in what God called, you know, yeah, Lord, I, I see that. It's clear you want me to do that or I, or I shouldn't be doing that. But it isn't always easy. However, God's desire is obedience to his will. Keep in mind when it comes to surrendering, not only do we need to make sure we're in a position where you can listen, you have to be able to hear from God you also need to be in, a uh, be in a position where you can hear from God. He was listening and he heard. Look at 22 and verse number 1. Again, he makes it clear in verse 1. It came to pass. Oh, at the very end he says, Behold, here I am. Abraham came to know the Lord back in Genesis 12. And watch this. Genesis 12, he says to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred. And he says, Go to a land... And he, I love this part. He says, that I will show you. So it wasn't a blind leap. Does that make sense? It wasn't blind. He said, I'll show it to you. But it still took faith on the part of Abraham. Abraham wasn't perfect, but he knew the Lord. As soon as God speaks to Abraham, Abraham responds. This implies he'd been listening. Notice also, if you would, go back, look at Genesis 22 and look at verse 2. God revealed his plan for Abraham's life. It was not about Isaac. This was a necessary part of the process, for no man can know the mind of God until God reveals it to the man. Notice his command. It's very definite. Verse 2. Thy son, thine only, what? Whom thou, what? Abraham's son, Ishmael, had already been sent away. Now the command comes that would take Isaac away as well. See, see, understand, God was asking everything from Abraham. All his hopes, all his dreams, all his plans, everything. As God is saying, take Isaac, thy son, thy only son, and put him on the altar. In essence, God was telling him, give it all to me. Notice how detailed God is about that. God was very precise for Abraham. He told him specifically what to do. Go to a place that I will show thee of. Surrender. You're here this morning and you're thinking, okay, the message is on surrender for such a time as this. I'm, I know now the, my body is the temple of the living God. It was purchased. I don't belong to myself. What do I need to do to surrender? It involves preparation. 
Look at 22 and verse 3. Notice this, Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took his two young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Abraham wasted no time, but got himself up, gathered everything he would need to do what God had commanded. He left nothing out, but, to, but took nothing extra. There's an urgency when God tells you to do something, to respond. An urgency. I'll give you one, probably won't turn to very many, very many more verses, but I want to give you one verse I want everybody to see that typifies that point. Look at John chapter 9. Please, if you would, John 9 and one verse. John chapter 9. Now notice if you would in John 9 and look at verse number John 9 and verse 4. Notice the imminency that's put on this. Notice what he says. Jesus says in verse number 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is what? The night cometh when no man can work. There's going to come a time where you can no longer serve God. There's going to come a time where you can't witness to anybody anymore. A book I read a long time ago, a very good book I'd recommend it, is The One Thing You Can't Do in Heaven. Yeah. One thing you can't do in heaven, you're not going to be able to witness about Jesus Christ. You can only do that down here. Not the one thing. It's one thing you can't do. And that's one thing you can't do. You can't give to missions. You can't teach that Sunday school. You can't sing in the choir. You can't work in the nursery. You can't be an usher. You can't be a hostess. You can't, just even your community and the things that we want to do with our fire, mar our, our fire department or our police department, um, uh, things that we're trying to do in the community, those serving God, whatever that is, you can't do it later. He says, work for the night is coming when man works no more. May I say that we should surrender for such a time as this. Procrastination has caused the death of many spiritual decisions. Procrastination has caused the death of many spiritual decisions. You know what? We miss out because we hesitate. We miss out. He was prepared in his mind. Look at Genesis 22. Look at verse 4. He was prepared. He says this, and on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Abraham had three days and three nights to think about what was about to happen. To him, it must have been, made no sense at all, yet he did it without question. Even though he couldn't add it up mentally by faith, he was willing to obey. This is the key to a consistent spiritual victory. We're called to walk by faith. See, Brother Dean was standing over here and he probably knew that with the law of physics, there is no way that that was going to come back and hit him. It just isn't going to happen. We can know that. But I'm telling you, when it comes to faith, sometimes there's a little unknown. And, and it's taking that next step, saying, Lord, you want me to do this? Or I need to surrender this? Dr. Shemesh preached a message here a couple, three years ago, and he titled the message From Faith to Faith. And I remember when he had done the graphic, it was some water, and it had some, uh, like, cobblestones that went through the water, and it kind of went like this. And the point was, God in your life, you're sitting here right now, God's going to take you from this step to the next step, to the next step, to the next step, to the next step. But you're charting the course as each time you take that step, you're taking that step by faith. The Bible says in Romans 1.17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to what? Faith. faith. You're taking that next step of faith. That's surrender. I think of 2 Corinthians 5.7, the Bible says we walk by faith and not by faith. That's what God desires for you and me is to walk by faith, to believe him and say, all right, Lord, uh, I, I understand Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your body, your body, which is the temple 
of the living God. He, in the Old Testament, God dwelt in the, in the holy of holies in a physical place. But now that the veil has been rent in two, and that you have direct access to God, now God dwells in you, no longer in buildings. You are the church. You're the church. You walk out and you go into your respective communities and you go into your workplace. You're the church. The church is made up of a body of believers. Greek word ekklesia, a called out assembly. That's what you are. You're a called out assembly. Yes, you, we, we unite together, but the body of Christ goes out into the mission field, right? And the mission field is the world. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, the Bible says, for they're white under harvest. Faith to faith. So Abraham was prepared. He prepared his heart. He was willing to surrender. Notice verse 5. Look at the faith Abraham had. Genesis 22, one of my favorite parts of this passage, and I know there's so many great examples of this being a picture of the Jesus Christ. There's too many to even begin. I'm not going to get into the, the types here this morning. Look at verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go younger. So look up here for just a minute. He's telling, remember he says he, he, had, he had men with him, right? And they're getting ready to go at the bottom of the mountain. And he has the other guys with him, the other lads, he calls them. He's telling them, verse number 5, Abraham said unto his young men, Abide here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder, and what? And will come again unto you. Plural. Folks, did you get that? Some of you say, well, I already knew that. Well, some didn't. Abraham had enough faith to know that he was going to come back with Isaac. Yes. Even though God said, no, 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 you're going to lay, you're going to give him to me as a sacrifice. God wants you and me to be in a place where no one thing in our lives have, have a more pres or more precious to us than he is. The last thing I want us to see is that the temple that we have carries with it a, divi a divine responsibility. Go back to 1 Corinthians 6. It'll be the last verse we look at, kind of where we started. The temple has, really, the temple was a place where men carried out the duties that had been given to them by God. Things such as the sacrifice, the tithe, the offerings, the prayers were all carried out at the temple. It was a place where the duties were performed. But you know, our fleshly temples are a place where we are to carry out the duties that we've been given by God. We, we looked at the Old Testament example, and I didn't have time to get into the, all the examples of the Old Testament of where the Holy of Holies is and all that work and, 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 and what have you, but that was the Old Testament. Now, God dwells in you. Paul says our fleshly temples are a place to carry out the duties that we've been given by God. Paul referred to himself as a servant. Literally means a bond slave. One who's made a conscious decision to give himself totally over to the Lord. Is your temple a place where the duties of the Lord are carried out? There are many areas where we are duty bound before the Lord. In witnessing, in worship, that's what they did at the temple. In giving, in obedience, in holiness, in righteousness, and a thousand other ways. Let's make sure that we're using our temple the right way. After all, after all, 1 Corinthians 6, look at the verse. Last verse we look at, look at verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body, that your body here today, if you're saved, is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is what? Look up here for just one minute. The Holy Spirit of God lives and dwells in you. Where you go, he goes. What you watch, he watches. What you listen to, he listens to. What you say, he hears. And we can, you read your Bible and see, the Bible says clearly, we can grieve the Holy Spirit of God by doing things we ought not to do. We can quench the Spirit. We can grieve the Spirit. And we don't want to do that. The Holy Spirit lives in you if you're saved. You're the temple of the living God and you're not your own. 
keep reading. He says, which you have of God and you are not your own. Last verse, verse 20, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In just a minute, I'm going to have Jennifer come and she's going to play the piano and or the keyboard, whatever she wants to do. But I know in this invitation that we have today is going to be very simple. It is going to be this. I want you, and this, this I'll, I'll be honest with you this morning. I got up this morning when I, you know, I felt weak. I still felt dehydrated. I still felt like I'm doing, I can't, Lord, I can't do this. I am letting Kurt know it's all you. And, uh, and I just kept thinking of that verse. His strength is made perfect in weakness. And I'll, I'll tell you something. I got up and when I got ready and I put my message together on Monday, which never happens. It just doesn't happen. I just came to me on Monday and luckily, and uh, I, I got in this morning and I just said, Lord, I want to make sure that I am surrendered to you. I don't want to stand before your people and say surrender for such a time as this unless I'm surrendered. This message is, is, is just as applicable to you as it is me. But I'm just admonishing you as your pastor out of, out of love as, as the best I can. Take inventory of your life. Find out, Lord, you, am I surrendered? You've bought me with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I belong to you. I'm, your, I'm yours, and I want to present you, my body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto you, which is my reasonable service. It's reasonable. It's not some amazing thing that we present our bodies. It's not, it's, no, it's reasonable. So I don't know where you are today. I have no idea. I know this is the message the Lord laid on my heart. I, I came in Monday, Brother Andrew, and I sat right where you were, and I said, Lord, what do you want me to preach? That was Monday morning, next week. Sunday, Sundays come pretty fast. And I said, Lord, what do you want? And this is what he laid on my heart. I don't know where you are today. I have no idea. God knows. But I want to encourage you. Ask yourself the question, Lord, am I surrendered? Am I willing to surrender? Is there something I'm doing that I shouldn't or is there something that I'm not that I should? And you could say, well, preacher, that applies to all of us. We'll find out what it is and let's just, until Jesus comes, work on it. Amen. We need to work for the night is coming when man works no more. I'm going to have Brother Andrew.